I mean, I was writing as a hobby. I never in a million years thought that I would ever be a published author. I thought you had to have like a blog or a degree of some sort to be able to write books. You had to have street creds. You couldn't just decide to write a book, um, which is essentially what I what I did. Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us for the 2024 National Book Festival Author Talk Series. Since 2015, PBS Books has shared with audiences across the country the voices of dynamic, diverse authors as they attended book festivals. PBS Books is proud to partner with the Library of Congress to promote their 2024 National Book Festival. Let's take a moment to hear from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Greetings from Washington to all fellow book lovers. I'm Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, and I want to thank you for your support of author events here on PBS Books. We hope you can join us on Saturday, August 24th, at the Washington Convention Center for the 2024 National Book Festival. We'll have an amazing lineup of authors, including Doris Kearns Goodwin, James McBride, Sandra Cisneros, Tamron Hall, and many more. And if you can't make it to DC, you can watch the live stream or videos of the festival online. Hope you have a wonderful summer and happy reading. We are also grateful to our station partner, Virginia Public Media. Here to guide the conversation is VPM News, Focal Point, journalist, Karis Manzanares. Welcome, Karis. Thank you, Heather, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about the 2024 Library of Congress National Book Festival with featured author Abby Jimenez and discuss her latest book in the Part of Your World series just for the summer. Welcome, Abby. Hi. It's so nice to have you here um, to talk about your book. Um, I read it in just a matter of hours um, because I was just so glued to the characters and the storyline. Um, in, in reading it, I thought about how perfect it was for our state slogan here in Virginia, which is Virginia is for lovers. For those who haven't read the book yet, can you briefly share a summary of your book? Sure. So Justin and Emma have a curse. Everybody that they date and break up with goes on to find the love of their lives after. And they meet through an MIV a-hole Reddit thread where Justin tells this story and Emma reaches out to him and they concoct a plan that if they date each other, in theory, when they break up, they should both go on to find their soulmates. So Emma, who's a travel nurse, goes to Minnesota for the summer just to date Justin just for the summer. And of course, things don't end up going as planned. So it's it's been um, a whirlwind with this book. It's been so amazing to see the reception to it. The relationship um, between this group of friends is so relatable from Emma to Justin and Maddie, who personally is my favorite. Um, <laughs> are the dynamics of these relationships based on your own friends? I, you know, there's always a little bit of me in every character, um, but I created Maddie specifically for Emma. So what I usually do is I figure out who the main characters are and then I, I create the love interest or the friends that that person needs. And Emma needed a Maddie in her life. She needed somebody who was going to be fiercely loyal to her, but who was also going to tell it like it is. And yeah, she's she's a fan favorite for sure. Yes, definitely. And it was in the beginning, I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's hard to get to love her because she's so <laughs> overprotective of Emma. But once you see the relationship and the love develop and you hear more about their history, I think it really binds them together for the reader. Um, one thing I really enjoyed about your book was the creative parts in it, where you bring in Reddit, where you have these survey questions. Um, where did you come up with the survey question idea and have you yourself ever received a predate survey? I have never received a predate survey. I've been married for a very long time. Uh, he doesn't need the survey. He knows exactly what I like. Uh, but there was actually a viral TikTok where this man uh, sent 
his date, a pre-date survey, and I loved it so much that I actually reached out to the woman who posted the video and asked if I could use that in the book. So I acknowledge her in the, uh, at the back of the book in the acknowledgments, and they are still together over two years later. They they moved in together and they have a dog, so these surveys clearly work. But I'm very online, and I like for my books to feel like these are people that we would actually know. They live in the same world that we do, so I use a lot of. Um, you know, pop culture, things that are relevant today. So, I mean, the fact that Justin's on Reddit and had posted this story, um, it feels very relatable because, you know, these are things that people do, you know? Uh, and I absolutely love those Am I the E-hole Reddit threads. I'm obsessed with them. <laughs> yes, I definitely felt like it was very this century type of read, you know, even the language and bringing in Reddit and social media. Um, I myself had seen your book, on my For You page before I read it. Um, so it's definitely in the book talk world um, and on TikTok. Uh, can you share a little bit about what that relationship is like with your readers on social media? Um, and how do you feel when you hear that your book is part of these like monthly friend book clubs and, and meetups and things like that? It is so cool that my book is on TikTok. I I have a really strong TikTok following, but for other things, like people follow me for my dogs or my stories about my daughter. Um, I've got, uh, because of that, I've got like this really strong relationship with my readers. They're very supportive and they're, um, you know, they'll, when I have a book come out, they'll go and they'll buy like every single version of the book. They'll buy the, the paperback, they'll buy the audiobook, they'll buy the Kindle edition. Um, but it really did take off on TikTok independent of my popularity on the app, which is fantastic to see. And I was able to hit a lot of my sort of author bingo card marks with this book. I've, I had a lot of goals, you know, like I wanted to see somebody with my book out in the wild, you know, um, somebody reading my book, not on their way to a conference where they were going to go meet me, but just actually organically reading my book. And that happened for me. That video went viral on TikTok. Uh, I wanted to um, be on the New York Times bestseller list for multiple weeks. This book has been on the list for 16 weeks now. Uh, it's just really hit so many cool marks for me. And TikTok was a huge part of that, obviously. It's just so fun to see people reading it. And I love the book clubs where people theme the book club, you know, where they're they're making the things that are talked about in the book. Um, for example, Justin makes spaghetti and he makes like these hot dog garlic breads and people will make the spaghetti and the hot dog garlic bread for their book club. It's so fun to see. Readers um, like myself were glued to this book. I mean, I read it literally in five hours um, and I know that there's others that are reading it and just shorter amount of time. Um, how long did it take you to write this book? And is there <laughs> kind of like a feeling like, you know, you put so much work into this just for your readers to read it in like five or less hours? Uh, I write one book a year and it depends on the book. So, you know, start to finish first draft. I'd probably say like if I were sitting down clocking it, it probably takes me three to four months to write a first draft, but there's so many layers of edits. All of my books go through very rigorous beta reads and I have advisors, I have a mental health advisor, I have, um, you know, I have nurse advisors, I have doctor advisors, like whatever roles the characters play in the book, I always have an advisor for that role. So there's so many rounds of edits where I'm implementing the feedback that I'm getting from my beta readers and my advisors. There's copy edits, there's, um, you know, there's just so many layers. So I would say like a good eight, nine months of just, you know, working on a book that you guys read in like four hours, which blows my mind. Um, I'm just glad everyone's having fun. And I love that my books are very readable in that way, um, that they're bingeable, that you can sit down and the, and the writing is easy to absorb. I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, my books got them back into reading, which is like one of my favorite things to hear. And I think it's because they are so digestible. Um, the dialogue feels very natural. I know that's one thing I'm really strong at is um, believable and natural dialogue. And I think that really pushes the story along. So um, while I wish that you got longer to enjoy it, I'm just glad that you are. And, you know, you said you started writing for yourself and never really thought about going anywhere. Uh, what motivates you to keep writing? Uh, I mean, I was writing as a hobby. I never in a million years thought that I would ever be a published author. I thought you had to have like a blog or a degree of some sort to be able to write books. You had to have street creds. You couldn't just decide to write a book, um, which is essentially what I what I did. Um, 
And it's just, it is so fun having people enjoy these stories. And that's what really keeps me going. I always say that writing a book feels like you're watching a really cool TV show that you are very, very much enjoying, but there's literally nobody else to talk to about it because no one else has seen it. So when I, you know, have other people that have read the book and they're loving it as much as I am and they're making fan art and they're, you know, hosting these book clubs and they're just as attached to the characters as me, it's one of my favorite things, honestly. Very cool. You know, you talked about how you have your own team that kind of you bounce ideas off of or help advise you when you're doing research um, in writing a book. Um, this book has a mentions of mental health, PTSD, toxic relationships. Um, how does that team that you've assembled uh, help you navigate those conversations and scenarios that then you bring into your writing and ultimately your books? My advisors and my beta readers are instrumental in the success of my books. It is very important to me that anything that I write is accurate and most of all that it's not harmful. Uh, I have a mental health beta reader that I've used for several of my books now, Dr. Karen Flood. She's a psychologist. And before I even started writing just for the summer, I knew what I wanted to get into with this book. I knew that I wanted to explore complex parental relationships and the effects that that has on you when you become an adult and you get into your own relationships. And we discussed this book at length so that I could completely understand uh, all of the challenges and the mental health struggles that each character had so that I could write it correctly in the first place. And then when I was done writing it, she went back and read it again and we fine tuned it from there. But a lot of people tell me that they identify with Justin, that they've had an Emma in, or not an Emma, they've had an Amber in their lives and it made them feel very seen. And which is honestly the biggest compliment that I can get because it means that I, I was able to accurately portray these very real life issues. I think we all have somebody toxic in our lives, not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be our mother, but we all have somebody toxic in our lives. And that can be very relatable for people and make people really feel seen when they see that on the page and know that they're not alone dealing with those things. I definitely think that goes back really to our conversation about this feeling very present, right? Very today. Um, and it's not, you know, topics that are traditionally, I feel like, explored in rom com. So it was refreshing to see, but also, um, you know, you're reading through it and sometimes you don't really acknowledge what's going on until you get to the end and see the bigger picture, um, which I also thought was just such a cool way to write that in. Um, you know, in your, in this world of just for summer or even in the part of your world series, um, is there a character that you most identify with? I know you said that every character kind of has a little bit about of you, but which um, character really do you feel like you identify with the most? I really like Jacob and yours truly. Jacob's anxiety depiction, I've been told, is some of the most accurate anxiety written into fiction. And that's because I am Jacob. I deeply understand anxiety. Uh, that was the one book that my mental health beta readers were like, well, I don't really have notes. Um, you know, Jacob is somebody who deals with social anxiety and uh, he's very introverted. And I very much understand how his brain works. So I think he's a very authentic character. And there was either, there was two camps when people read Yours Truly. It was either, oh my gosh, I am Jacob and I feel so seen, or oh my gosh, I know a Jacob and now I understand him better, uh, which is really great to hear. But I, I think Jacob, probably if, of all of my characters, Jacob was the one that I related to the most. For someone who's just discovering your work, um, do you think that they can start off just by reading Just for Summer as their first book? Or is there an order to things? Would you recommend that they read the Part of Your World series first? All of my books are standalones. So you can just pick up one. Like if you want to see if you like my writing, you can pick up any of my books and you know, you'll know you understand everything you're reading. You don't need to read the previous books, but for all of the fantastic Easter eggs that I like to plant into my books, I do recommend that you read them in order at the very least, start with part of your world and then read yours truly. And then just for the summer, you will get the most out of just for the summer if you read them in that order. And then if you like my writing, swing back around and start with the friend zone series and read those. Um, there are characters that are mentioned in the friend zone that are mentioned all the way in my sixth book, just for the summer. So it's fun to kind of 
you know, live in that universe and continue to see previous characters carrying on into the other books. And like you said, you do kind of weave a web of your characters across all of your books. How do you keep all the storylines and connections straight when you're writing? Do, does this start in the pre-planning phase or how do you decide what characters will be part of what book? My characters very much feel like real people to me. It doesn't feel like I'm writing fictional people. It feels like I'm writing people that I know. So in that way, it's not hard for me to keep track of them because they're people I know. Um, I will say that when I'm deciding who's going to be the next character in the next book, I don't always know that. You know, sometimes I'm in the middle of writing a book and then a character pops out to me and I'm like, I think this character is really speaking to me and I feel like my readers are going to want their story next. And, you know, that's how I'll know that's the character I'm carrying into the next book and we're going to see their love story. But, you know, sometimes I know several books ahead what I'm going to do. And sometimes I don't know at all. And it speaks to me as I'm writing. But I do really love that we get to keep seeing a lot of these characters throughout the series. And I'm going to continue to do that um, in my seventh and eighth book, which I'm already working on my eighth book. My seventh book, which comes out next year, is already finished. Um, and so I already know the character connections from just for the summer to that one. And even in my eighth book, we have more character connections, which is just really fun. Do you want to give the audience a small hint of what they can expect from book seven or eight? Sure. So I can't talk about book eight yet. Uh, it's not done. I don't have a title. Um, I'm about 80% of the way through it, but book seven is complete. I have seen the cover. Uh, we're working on the back uh, jacket copy now, which is really fantastic, which means that very soon there's going to be a cover reveal. Uh, that book is about a woman caring for her mother who, with early onset dementia. It's called Say You'll Remember Me. And she meets a cranky veterinarian after she finds a, um, a an injured kitten in a wood pile. Uh, it's a grumpy sunshine trope. It's beautiful and funny and sad, uh, like all of my books are. We've got the more serious topics in it, but of course I handle them with as much sensitivity as they require. And it's uh, coming out on April 1st of next year. For your audiobook fans, um, what can listeners expect when they hear Just for Summer? Um, did you have a hand in selecting who would be voicing um, the characters and what is that process like? So most of what I read is via audiobooks. I absolutely love audiobooks and narrators can make or break it for me. So I am very, very, very involved in my audiobook production. I think I drive them bonkers sometimes. I'm like, we need to redo this whole chapter. Um, I really like Zachary Weber for my male heroes. He just is so good. He just innately understands the characters. He requires so little direction and his voice is just so swoony. So I will continue to use Zachary Weber for my future books. And then I often change up the female narrators based on who that character is. Um, some of my favorites are Julia Whalen. She did Part of Your World with Zachary Weber. Um, and then we had Kyla Garcia for Yours Truly, who's a fantastic narrator. She did a really good job in that book. And then for Just for the Summer, it's uh, Christine Lakin who absolutely nailed Emma. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to ask for the Zachary Weber, Christine Lincoln team for Say or Remember Me as well, just because I, I love how they narrate together. But uh, yeah, my audiobooks are known for being really, really good. And it's because I'm so passionate about them myself. I don't, I don't want a bad audiobook. It just completely throws you out of the story. Your fans uh, write a lot about your Abby-isms. Um, these can be lines of reflection, words of encouragement, or even funny quotes. Uh, where do you find your Abby-ism inspirations? You know, I don't know. Somebody asked me that last night, too. Like, there's a line in Party of Your World that people get tattooed on their body. It's, um, uh, grace costs you nothing. And I don't know. Like, I'll just be writing and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking up, a line that, you know, would be something, some sage advice that a grandma would give her grandson. And it just, there it was. Like, I just, it just felt like something that somebody would say to their grandson. Uh, I Sometimes the book uh, leads me to the little, you know, lines that I write, like in, in um, yours truly, you know, there's the line, um, be harmless. Like, you know, they agree to be harmless to each other. And I got that because, you know, Rihanna very much is scared of men. She had a, a, a really terrible divorce. She doesn't trust men. And she 
um, compares, you know, men to like this one time she was in the woods and she saw this bear and she was so afraid of the bear, but the bear decided to be harmless to her. It was like they stood there and they agreed, even though this bear was dangerous and she had her bear spray, they both acknowledged that they were just going to be harmless to each other. And, and that line, you know, I will be harmless to you just came out of that scene that I had no intention to write. It just was like the natural progression of the story and who Brianna was as a person. So, um, the line that everybody really loves and just for the summer is um, in a world where you can choose anger or empathy, always choose empathy. That really resonates with people. And I'm so glad it is because it's such a healing line and a healing way to live your life. Um, you know, anger doesn't get you anywhere, but understanding can, you know, it can give you a lot of peace. Um, you know, when you realize that, that sometimes the bad people in your life don't want to be the villains in your life. You know, they've had things that happen to them too. And empathy can just be such a, a very healing thing to have. And, uh, you know, that's a very Emma line. You know, I think that that is something that Emma would absolutely say in a book. And again, I didn't go into it, you know, thinking I'm going to plug this line into the book. It just, that's who Emma was. And um, you know, that was a natural line to come from that character. I think another, um, kind of line and then that goes really into a passage that really did feel natural, right? Like the natural progression of the book um, is when you say the love stories sold us the wrong thing, right? And then you go into this passage of really what is love, right? And how do you show love for someone who you're living with? And you've gotten to know already, right? So um, did you draw on your own personal relationship for that passage or how did that come about? I definitely drew my own marriage for that. You know, I think the the whole segment, first of all, that that entire paragraph is so viral on TikTok. People are playing the audiobook or they're reading it directly from the book and it's gone so viral um, because it is very relatable. You know, I think that we have this image that you know, romance is always, you know, stars in the sky and, you know, romantic evenings and, you know, candlelit dinners. And, and that's not reality. Reality is, you know, loving somebody and romance is often very mundane. And, um, you know, it's, it's in the folds of everyday life, as, as I say in the book, it's folding socks with somebody on a sofa or, you know, little gestures of kindness and love that you do throughout the day that don't feel like a big deal, that aren't grandiose gestures, but that truly make up what is love in a relationship. And, um, Justin has that epiphany, you know, in, in the book about, you know, how, like when you think about it, when you've read just for the summer, these two never really got a traditional courtship. They never got any of the fun things. It's like most of their dates are interrupted. Most of the dates are, you know, permeated with drama within their family, you know, or they get sidelined and they have to go take care of kids. You know, they, they don't get what we consider to be like the movie romance, you know, courtship. And it's so beautiful anyway. It's so beautiful. Uh, I love that people really enjoyed that line. I remember exactly when I wrote it too. I was like, I, I, I write a lot on my cell phone. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't have to have a computer in front of me. I, you know, make notes on my phone. And I just came up with this while I was out with my husband somewhere. And I was like, you know what? I just, I feel like this is so true to this story. And I wrote it down in one sitting. And, um, you know, now it's it's sort of like immortalized on TikTok. Everybody loves it so much. I want to end with um, a burning question for you. Um, Justin is from Minnesota and you're from Minnesota. Is there really a toilet king of Minnesota? <laughs> Don't we all have a toilet king? Uh, so for those of you who haven't read the book, um, the story starts out with Justin complaining that he's got a new apartment and there's this hideous billboard right outside of his window. And it's a middle-aged man dressed as Henry Tudor um, holding a plunger over a poop-filled toilet bowl. Uh, it's a Toilet King ad. Toilet King billboards are everywhere all over you know, the city. And there is, um, there is a real estate agent here in Minnesota and he's got billboards all over the place and, you know, people have their opinions about it. I think that is a universal truth in every city across the U.S. It's like uh, an attorney or some sort of tradesman. Like there's everybody has their version of the Toilet King wherever they live. Uh, but there was a real life inspiration. You can read about him in the back and the acknowledgments. I almost used the real, you know, Toilet King um, from Minnesota, but I thought, you know, fictionalizing it and making it 
a plumber dressed as Henry Tudor would be more universal to everyone who might not necessarily uh, get, you know, the the real estate agent in our town. But um, yeah, it's it's a, a character actually that I'm going to carry into some of my future books. So we haven't seen the last of the Toilet King. Thank you, Abby, for spending time with the PBS book members and sharing the behind the book details of Just for the Summer. Thank you. It was so fun. Back to you, Heather. Thank you, Karis and Abby, for an amazing conversation. And thank all of you for joining us today. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of the 2024 National Book Festival Author Talks. The full schedule of featured author talks can be found on our website at pbsbooks.org. And don't forget, you too can be part of the festival on Saturday, August 24th from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. The event is free and open to the public. Visit loc.gov slash bookfest for all the details. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla and happy reading.